I uh, kind of wondered, was I actually accurate that Peter never mentioned a thing to the Jews, his audience in Acts chapter 2, mainly the Jews from all over the world and from Jerusalem. And he mentioned nothing about their way of life and how it is turned away from God. They must turn back to him, repent of their sins, turn away from sins. Not one syllable is mentioned in that direction except for the one thing that they did. They crucified Christ. So Peter's message to fellow Israelites, we're looking at Acts 2.22 and 29. Let's take a look at that. Acts 2.22 and 29. Acts 2.22 and 29. Come on, let's get... There you go. We got four windows. And we'll look at... Okay, we'll go back and look at Acts 2.22 and 29. Acts 2.1. Let's just make this the whole page. Look at 2.22. And it shall be, the men of Israel, listen to these words, Jesus the Nazarene, a man attested to you by God with miracles and wonders and signs which God performed through him in your midst, just as you yourselves know. That's Peter's message. You know, think about, well, you need to turn back to God. He's saying, this is Jesus the Nazarene, a man attested to you by God with miracles and wonders and signs, which God performed through him in your midst, just as you yourselves know. So he's implying that they already witnessed and could testify to the fact that he was uh, performing miracles and wonders and signs, which were through God, through him. And 29, brethren, I may confidently say to you regarding the patriarch David, that he both died and was buried in his tomb and is with us to this day. Well, that's the message. The Old Testament testifies to Jesus Christ, the son of David, descendant of David, the Messiah. So in response to the crowd's uproarious reaction to the disciples miraculously speaking in foreign languages in Jerusalem, that was not about the outpouring of the Holy Spirit the cause of the disciples' supernatural behavior. But his message was summed up as follows. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord in the sense of God and Christ in the sense of the Messiah, Messiah Savior, who in his humanity provided the atoning sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. Remember, John the Baptist announced Jesus the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And the many passages in the Old Testament that foretold of the Messiah to come. The iniquity of us all in Isaiah was taken upon him, put upon him. The Greek verb rendered has made does not signify that God fabricated Jesus into being Lord and Christ at that moment in time. Rather, it is saying that Jesus was declared to be God by God to be both Lord, referring to his eternal deity as the Son of God, and Christ. Hamashiach in the Hebrew, Christ, Christos in the Greek, God's anointed one in the sense of having fulfilled the requirement in his humanity of being an atoning sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. You see that, especially in the prophecies of Isaiah. Which declaration was evidenced by God's raising having raised him from the dead <clears throat> and ascended him into glory at his right hand in heaven. <clears throat> Peter began his message by drawing attention to the fact that Jesus was a Nazarene, a native of the city of Nazareth, hence one of their own, an Israelite. Unto us the son of is born, a child is given, Israel, wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting father, prince of peace. The Hebrew word Netzer rendered Nazarene is derived from the root the word for a branch, a word used to identify the Messiah in other passages as the righteous branch, <clears throat> a new shoot that will rise from the stump of what was left of David's line and bring in the coming kingdom. Isaiah 11, 1-4. <clears throat> Jeremiah 
Jeremiah 23.5, Zechariah 3.8, and 6.12. So Peter then declared that Jesus was a man approved by God among you, Jews, referring to the people of Israel. The evidence that Jesus was approved by God with his, was his performing mighty works and wonders and signs in the midst of the people. So far, Peter's message, as some can it was, but it wasn't, is not repent for the kingdom of God is the hand, repent, turn from your sins, but repent and believe in this coming Messiah whom you crucified. And you keep on going. And he did this evidently so that the people of Israel would have the opportunity to recognize and trust in him as their Messiah. For Peter declared that the people were in full knowledge of the mighty miraculous works of God done through Jesus. And if they all repent and believed in him, guess what? The kingdom of God is at hand, imminent to come, and would come at that moment. So far, throughout the 2,000 years of the church history and before, all Israel did not trust in their Messiah Savior. Furthermore, Peter declared this one Jesus by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, having been given up, having been taken by lawless hands, having been crucified, you did put to death. They did put to death, as well as the Romans, and all humanity, actually. Notice that the destiny of Jesus was determined by the Lord's determinate counsel and foreknowledge, i.e., by his decrees, which, because of his absolute sovereignty, established his infallible foreknowledge, his knowledge beforehand. We already looked at election election and related documents. You can take a look at that. On the other hand, Jesus was taken by lawless hands and crucified. So God's determinate counsel and foreknowledge, which define his purpose and decrees to carry out that purpose, unfailingly reflect his absolute sovereignty. Hence, it is implied that nothing man does of his own free will is outside of the determinate counsel and foreknowledge, i.e., outside of the decrees and sovereignty of God. Hence, Peter laid the blame for the death of Christ directly upon those lawless hands who took him, i.e. the Gentile rulers of Palestine, and yet declared that Jesus was crucified by you, referring to the Jews, and to all mankind. There you go. But Peter declared that it was Jesus whom God did raise up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible for him to be held by it. In other words, Jesus' resurrection was attributed solely and directly to God his absolute sovereignty in all matters. So Peter was saying that it was not possible for Jesus in his humanity to be held by death because by God's absolute sovereignty and determinate counsel, he decreed that Jesus in his humanity should be raised from the dead. Consider that Jesus is both God and man. Acts 2, 23 and 24. In actuality, a number of places in Scripture, it says God the Father raised Jesus from the dead. It also says Jesus raised himself from the dead. And it says the Holy Spirit raised Jesus from the dead. They're all God. One God, three personalities. God did one person, I did it, they all did it. So, Acts 2, 25 to 31. Peter provided scriptural corroboration from Psalm 16 to the crowd of Jews in Jerusalem that Jesus was their Messiah Savior. Since David rested on the sure hope of God's deliverance from temporal difficulties and unto eternal life, through the Messiah Savior, the Holy One of God, so God would not allow His Holy One, the descendant of David, to see physical corruption in the grave, but He would be resurrected from the dead and would rule on the throne of David forever. 225-231 So, Peter provided scriptural corroboration to the crowd of Jews in Jerusalem of what he was saying about Jesus being the Messiah Savior who was resurrected from the dead by God by quoting and interpreting Psalm 16, 8 to 11. He quoted, interestingly enough, from the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Old Testament. In view was David's reflection of an ongoing relationship he had with the Lord unto eternal life. In Psalm 16, 8 to 9, as quoted in Acts 2, 25 to 26, David was foreseeing, in perfect tense, ongoing action, that the Lord would always be before him at his right hand as Lord, constant protector, comforter, savior, etc., so David stated that he would not be shaken from his intimate relationship with the Lord by what life brought him. And because of this, David's heart and his tongue rejoiced. And he declared that his flesh and the sense of his body has rested, rested on the sure hope of the Lord's deliverance of him from temporal difficulties and unto eternal life. Note that the Greek word elpidi means a sure hope. 
not just, well, I hope so, in the English. In the Greek, it's a sure hope. Take a look at the study. Hope of salvation is sure hope. We all have that. We, we may not engage it. Sad to say, some lose sight of it. But they will go into heaven regardless of what they believe when they, at the moment that they have died. Psalm 16.10, as it is quoted in Acts 2.27, went on to quote David as saying, For you will not leave my soul in Hades, in the sense of his soul after death, not being left in the underworld of departed spirits. Take a look at this study here. Hades, and what that entails. David had the sure hope of being resurrected to eternal life in the eternal kingdom of God. David went on to say, Nor will you allow your body, your Holy One, to see corruption, in the sense of the dead physical human body of the Holy One not experiencing physical decay in the grave. Since David's body was buried and remains in a tomb and was not resurrected, hence his physical body did experience physical decay. Then the Holy One in this passage cannot be referring to David. David was evidently referring to the Messiah, Jesus Christ, the unique Holy One of Israel, the Messiah whose physical body God's word promised in 16.10 of Psalms would not experience physical decay. But once it was placed in a tomb and sealed up, it was raised from the dead without seeing decay. This was as it was interpreted by the apostles Peter in Acts 2.29-35 and again by Paul in Acts 13.35-37. So David went on in Psalm 16.11 as quoted in Acts 2.28 to say to the Lord, you have made known to me the ways of life, in the sense of how he was to conduct his moral life, that he was to worship the Lord and conduct his life in a mad, faithful manner, so that you will make me full of joy in your presence. Implying experiencing the resurrected eternal life in the presence of the Lord in the eternal kingdom of God. Those who don't believe experience resurrected life, but it won't be in eternal life with the presence of the Lord there in the eternal kingdom of God, sad to say. According to this passage, it is clear that the resurrection of the uncorrupted Holy One of God in Acts 2.27b is the Messiah Jesus Christ himself, and that he was absolutely essential to David's reception of eternal life. If he didn't get resurrected uncorrupted, then his plan would not be fulfilled. Peter pointed this out to the crowd of Jews in Jerusalem in his interpretation of the passage in Psalms. Peter says to them, <clears throat> Men and brethren, fellow Israelites, let me speak freely to you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. In the sense that David's decayed remains were still in the tomb where his body was placed. Therefore David, being a prophet, and having known that God had sworn with an oath to him that of the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, he would raise up the Christ to sit on David's throne, in the sense that Jesus Christ, in his humanity, was a descendant from David and will be the everlasting ruler of the eternal kingdom of Israel and the world, sitting on the throne that David sat upon centuries earlier. Hence, having foreseen this, he, David, spoke concerning the resurrection of the Christ, that his soul was not left in Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. So we can take a look at Psalm 16, 1 to 11, and the Masoretic text, the Hebrew text, as opposed to Peter's quotation of the Septuagint. And there are some differences. You can take a look at this. Apparently the uh, Septuagint is a little more reliable. Verb tenses mainly. So, <clears throat> David prayed and trusted in God for temporal and eternal salvation, declaring that there was nothing in life that was good apart from the Lord. He delighted in fellowship with fellow saints and rejected those who hastened after other gods. The Lord was his inheritance, hence he was incomparably and pleasantly blessed. Hence David blessed the Lord who gave him counsel day and night. So David was evidently in harm's way, which motivated him to trust in the Lord's protection, a good example for us. So he prayed to God to preserve him in the sense of saving him from harm in his mortal life. And this evidently included trusting in the Lord for eternal life. He declared that he had put his trust in the Lord to that end, for temporal and eternal salvation. In the next verse, David elaborated upon that trust. He says, O my soul, referring to himself, speaking out to the Lord in prayer, my goodness is nothing apart from you, indicating God's understanding that everything...